Greetings and welcome to another Insight Project video. Welcome, welcome. So I thought in this video I would demonstrate how to grow Rochelle salt crystals. And um, you might be thinking, you know, why? that's crazy, man. Why would you do something like that? So I thought I'll spend the first five, ten minutes just talking a little bit about Rochelle salt. And then um, the last five, ten minutes, we'll demonstrate how you grow it and then uh, spend a minute and see what, what we actually have at the end. So, I guess we could start at Wikipedia. It's not the worst place, but um, it gets a lot more interesting once you dig just a little bit deeper. Um, but here they're noticing it was first prepared by an apothecary um, and that it is piezoelectric so this is why this is really why I'm interested in it Rochelle salt is piezoelectric which means when you press on it with mechanical force there's an electricity there, there's a, a voltage difference that that appears and it's um, really the granddaddy of piezoelectricity that's this is where it was discovered and it's also pyroelectric meaning that it has a different voltage depending on the temperature and finally it's ferroelectric which is the strangest one of all which is when it's subjected to a particular um, voltage potential it doesn't go back to its original um, voltage it just sits there at a new voltage after that and that's um, that's the one that I um, also want to look at as this goes along. And finally, um, it has been used medicinally as a laxative. And I mean, it, you know, it was a hit as a laxative in France. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, there's a couple of good write-ups on it. So I mean, it's it's like a it's not a triple threat. It's a quadruple threat. <laughs> It's ferroelectric, it's laxative, it's piezoelectric, it's pyroelectric. It's what more could you what more could you ask from a single simple crystal? Um, this is another reason why I wanted to make it is most of the stuff on the internet they go through like how they were getting it from you know the vineyards in France. You know, you start with tartar and the minimum acid content and then uh, sodium hydroxide, the PHA, activated charcoal, chemically purified, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what does this even mean? The filter is evaporated 42 uh, BE, um, and so on and so forth. And I, I admit there is a lot of good work on the internet with a lot of videos and a lot of write-ups of people going just from the starting materials and getting... Um, you know, doing all of the work and ending up with Rochelle salt. Um, you know, how, however, I'm I'm a simple guy, and it's it's sort of like, well, why don't you just buy the Rochelle salt? And that's what you can do. <laughs> it saves you a lot of work. So here, I mean, I just bought this. It was like the first result on Amazon. It's like seven bucks a bottle. It comes as two bottles. So that saves you from going through what they were starting to talk about there on um, on the Wikipedia write-up. So if you want to go from the you know the tartar to baking soda and baking powder and you know worrying about the pH and the activated charcoal and all that more power to you and I think that's wonderful and again um, there are some good videos and write-ups in that but if you just buy the stuff <laughs> you just heat the water pour it in the, in the water until it, it you can't put any more in and then leave it out on the windowsill so it's sort of like this is easier than people are making it out to be although I will say as I delved into it there's a whole art there's like multiple patents of actually growing great crystals that um, that are consistent, things like that. So let's let's get away from Wikipedia now and kind of dive in. There are two write-ups that I want to spend, hopefully, just like two minutes on each. So here's the first write-up, Rochelle Salt by Michael Gasperi, 
and that's an interesting website. And I, as I delved into this, I, I noticed a lot of people are interested in Rochelle Saul. It's not just me. And Michael talks a lot about um, the history. I, I really enjoy write-ups like this. The history and also a great deal on how to grow the crystals. Um, so he's just saying, you know, he made a, you know, he might have plagiarized stuff, you know, whatever. But, uh, <laughs> heck, I probably plagiarized whole chunks of this. Um, but it's a, it's an interesting um, write-up that he did. So he's it's named after the port city of La Rochelle, France, and there were some pharmacists there that um, were doing herbal kind of medicines, and um, they were looking for laxatives. Um, and what they came up with was this byproduct of the wine industry. And so you have the the tartar and then the acid and then the, the car sodium carbonate as the base and so that gives you a salt when you have an acid and a base. Um, so this gentleman actually dug out like some labels from the time for the the product that it was it was actually a hit at the time as a as a pharmaceutical. Um, so that's another thing about this too is that you know you don't need like fume hoods and, and masks and gloves which is nice it's you know if it if it doesn't work you know you can just I mean don't do this but you could just eat it um, and there's there's the dosage but don't do that and again once you once you start to pull on these threads everything becomes interesting so the Curies uh, um, uh, Madame Marie Curie fame uh, two two Nobel Prizes there uh, best known, of course, for radioactivity. But she and her husband Pierre did a lot of work. They were the first to identify that Rochelle salt was also piezoelectric. Um, 1824, this gentleman noticed that it's pyroelectric, and then they noticed that it's piezoelectric. So that's kind of just an interesting aside there that a lot of people have been interested in Rochelle Salt. Now, I keep reading this and so far I haven't had success. It remains to this day one of the most piezoelectric substances ever, ever found. My first batch kind of stunk. It was a little bit better than wood. But, as I read on this, you can't get away with not... That person doesn't look very happy. Uh, you can't get away with not um, using distilled water. So it's uh, something where you really need to use distilled water. And here is the, the webmaster just uh, at a museum in France. And now it becomes interesting because it developed a war application and where it became central to development of sonar technology for hunting submarines. And so, when something's piezoelectric, it will generate an electric current in response to a deformation. And similarly, if a current is applied, it, it deforms. So you can use it to send out a ping and then um, try to have it register the reflected ping. So I thought that was kind of cool, like when you here in movies, those pings, it's either like uh, the quartz approach or the Rochelle salt approach with sonar. And so here he's just talking about it, you know, as used with uh, microphones and speakers. Um, also used with phonograph uh, needles, if I recall. I don't think it's in this write up. Um, now, here are what good crystals look like. Mine haven't looked that good, but that's when you really put the time into growing them correctly and there are you know whole books uh, classic text crystals and crystal growing and um, so there are patents in the area and things like that there's a like a whole art to it but I just want to see can I can I grow some uh, I, I don't know if I'll get something you know anywhere near that good, but can I just grow something that's piezoelectric? 
Uh, is there anything else in here I want to talk about? That's just the Rochelle salt saturation curve. So as I said, you just heat the water and a lot of it can saturate in hot water and then you let the water cool, it comes out of the saturation and, and crystallizes. And he spends a lot of time, you know, like how you make it from scratch with the baking soda, distilled water. Yeah, I really should have known this the first time. Um, you don't, you can't use tap water. Um, and cream of tartar, but you got to get the right one because if it's not pure enough, it's not going to be good. And then, you know, here are the steps for the first part. <laughs> so it's like, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm okay with just buying the Rochelle Sol. It's not like it's a hundred bucks. And um, then a little bit, there's, uh, again, just, you know, articles and books and patents on how to do it correctly and things like that. So that's that article. The one that I found even more interesting, though, was this one. Um, just another kind of uh, write-up. I just, I love these kinds of write-ups. Uh, short history of ferroelectricity. It all began with the salt in La Rochelle. And again here we see David Brewster who saw that it was pyroelectric and the Curies who saw that it was um, piezoelectric. Yeah, here's where I saw it. Edison um, used it in the phonograph. Um, and again, during World War I is where it became uh, very important as a submarine detector. And um, I believe that was someone who worked on that. Um, so as he starts to get into um, ferroelectricity, he notes this um, professor in Zurich who hypothesized that some molecules carry a, a permanent electric dipole moment, an analogy to the magnetic moment of paramagnetic substances. So that's where it starts to get even more interesting. And, you know, he says there's probably like a Curie temperature, like a ferromagnet, and um, then we, we got to bring in Edwin Schrodinger, you know, no no small luminary there and Schrodinger was the one who first uh, said that you know that you could have something uh, ferroelectric and he coined that term in 1912 and this is another um, I've looked at this person's paper and this is something I want to read more on was um, Joseph Vlasic um, out of Ohio and he did a lot of work in this um, and he was studying under a professor um, who was known for work in cosmic rays cosmic ray physics so Vlasic started a, a rigorous study of the analogy between magnetic properties of ferromagnetics and the dielectric properties of Rochelle salt and what he saw and concluded was that the behavior, the displacement electric intensity and polarization are analogous to BH and I in the case of magnetism. The data is due to a hysteresis in P analogous to magnetic hysteresis. This would suggest a parallelism between the behavior of Rochelle salt as dielectric and steel, for example, as a ferromagnetic substance. Um, bearing out this idea, the hysteresis curves obtained for Rochelle salt analogous are analogous to the BH curves of magnetism. So that's a, a bit complicated, but the take home there, as I read it, is just as, like if you have a screwdriver, you know, you take a magnet and you put it at the end of the screwdriver, you know, you leave it there for a while or rub it on there for a while, and then afterwards that screwdriver will pick up iron screws, which is kind of nice. You know, it's a nice thing to do to your screwdriver. So unless you're screwing in a brass screw, then you, it's a lot easier to keep the screw in place or pull the screw out if you, you know, if it's just sitting there on its side or something. So 
in the same way that a screwdriver will pick up a magnetic field when exposed to a magnetic field, Rochelle salt will pick up an electric field when exposed to an electric field. That's, that's how I read what he's saying here. And then they have this graph. This is a, a hysteresis graph that he, um, from his data. Let's just spend a, a, a 30 seconds on that. So I've enlarged it, but it's, it's really hard to read. But this is your electric field on this axis. And this, I believe that says coulombs, and I think that says charge. So the way I interpret this is you have your Rochelle salt here with no electric field. You expose it to an increasing electric field, and there's a charge or voltage that you see, and eventually, apparently asymptotically, approaches a limit there. And then you decrease the field, and and you know this is what a hysteresis curve is. It doesn't follow that that line; it follows this line. So now you go back to zero, and you're sitting at a different voltage than you started. Isn't that odd? So just as you know, the screwdriver will hold a magnetic field after being exposed to a magnetic field, the Rochelle salt will hold an electric field after being exposed to an electric field. Then the paper goes on to say, perhaps the most history-making graph is that of the temperature dependence of the piezoelectric response um, for Rochelle salt. So I've enlarged this graph, and deflection, I don't know what that is, CM centimeters maybe? I don't know. I, I take it as that's how good the piezoelectricity is. And what I found really interesting here, because the x-axis is... Um, I would say degrees centigrade, that there's room temperature right around 20 Celsius. And so it looks like looks like you want to be around freezing for the most positive electricity. So I don't know. I'm, uh, that's another thing I'm going to have to look at. But that's where it looks like it's most piezoelectric. And from here, um, he just goes on that, you know, so now scientists said, well, if this thing's piezoelectric, what else is piezoelectric? And so there was a lot of work by a lot of scientists looking for other piezoelectric materials. Um, K3PO4, I don't know why I found this funny, KH2PO4, my gosh! <laughs> so I guess that's sort of an inside joke. Um, I guess that's a famous one or something. Uh, either that or it's a typo. Um, so there are now known to be a lot of ferroelectric materials. Um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, barium titanate is um, one. A provoscite ferroelectric. And provoscites are a big area of research, especially in relation to um, kind of... Um, using their properties to try to improve solar cells. Um, so there are, now there are known to be a lot of um, ferroelectrics, but um, Rochelle salt is still a very good one. And so it's really had a big in impact. It's um, been used with uh, certain types of um, capacitors, uh, phonograph pickups, accelerometers, ultrasound generators, sonar devices, etc. So the paper has some also good discussion on, you know, why is this there and, you know, is it related to hydrogen bonding? Um, but they've found it also now materials without hydrogen bonds and um, so on and so forth. So there's some good theoretical discussion, but I think that's that's really enough for you to get an idea of, you know, why I'm interested. So let's wrap up this part, and now we'll see whether it works that I'll be able to show you how you too can grow your own pyroelectric, piezoelectric, ferroelectric, Rochelle, Rochelle salt crystals. So that, that's um, what we're going to do now. So here, I apologize about the noise, I fired up the, the water distiller and when this, this thing gets heated up, 
there'll be distilled water that will come out. It'll drop into here, and we don't need that much of it. Here are some crystals that I grew last time with tap water. And you see they're nice, but they're, they're not like beautiful. They don't look like diamonds or anything, that's for sure. But they are nice and they are piezoelectric. Um, so that's sort of what you want to do. Here's, this is what I ordered, you know, Rochelle saw. <laughs> why, why spend, it was, I, I got two of these for like seven bucks or something like that. I, maybe I'm wrong, but it was, it was inexpensive. I, I think that's within the ballpark. The one thing you want to be, well, let me just tell you how, how to do it first and then tell you what to be careful about. Um, Rochelle salt is, the solubility in water is greatly dependent on temperature. So what you do is you bring water to a boil, you put in Rochelle salt until it's fully saturated, no more dissolves, and then you let it cool on the windowsill. And, and that's it. That's all you have to do to make it. They make it so complicated on the internet. The, the one thing to be careful about is that um, this stuff, I actually, um, this came as like two bottles of this. And I went through one and, you know, one and a third of them before I actually got, um, you know, a little uh, pan, about, you know, um, you know, a little, a little uh, soup kind of thing, fully saturated. So in other words, uh, when I looked it up, it's something like two or three or four times the weight of the Rochelle salt will go into solution before it's fully saturated. So you don't want to boil a lot of water or otherwise you're never going to get um, the thing fully saturated. You just need a little bit of water. And that's all there is to it. So I'm going to, I'm going to let this go and then I'll, I'll do the next part. Not to make it you know, too big a deal of it, but there's, there's just the distilled water coming out of the still, and um, I'm going to let this fill up. We're not going to need the full of it. We probably won't need half a glass. We'll figure that out after I have the distilled water. Okay, so we got more than enough water here. Okay, so here we have our distilled water, Rochelle salt. What I want to do is just put the distilled water, this is where we'll grow the crystals, into here. And the reason I'm doing that is because the one thing that really surprised me the first time is just how soluble this stuff is once you get the water boiling. So I think that's enough water right there. Okay, so I only used about half of that, and since there's so little water, that'll, that'll get boiling really quickly. And then you just start putting this in until no more dissolves. And then once you have it fully saturated at boiling, then um, you go until there's a little bit of excess, and then we'll just run it through a coffee filter to get rid of any undissolved powder. So I have this at a slow boil now, and I'll start adding Rochelle salt. Ah! <laughs> oh, thank heavens. That could have been a disaster. But you can see it dissolves very well. what I mean about how soluble this is. We've gone through, it was up to like there, we've gone through half of it. And we're still not saturated. I hope I have enough. Only got about one more of those to do. It's starting to look like it's going to be saturated. So, it. I used all of this. All of that. This little bit of water. You can kind of see if I, if I can find it. There's a few specks that look like they didn't go into solution. So I, I think it's really close to being fully saturated. I'm just kind of winging it here, but I think um, the water will come off before the Rochelle salt. So I'm just going to let it boil for like two, three minutes and then, uh, and then go from there. 
Okay, so after letting it boil for a minute, now you can see there's some that's not going into solution. And so now we just run this through a coffee filter. Coffee filter. I gotta do this slowly so I don't screw this up. that a minute. Let's see, you can see all the stuff that didn't go in the solution. Good. So far so good. Give me a minute to let that drain. So while we're letting that drain, I'll say there was an interesting research article I found and I'll try and dig it out for this video if I can find it again. But what people were doing, um, they said was, you know, like you can have your super saturated solution there and they had one paper where they stuck a piece of wood in and, you know, weight the wood down. And so when it crystallizes, it'll crystallize also within the wood. And then the second part that they, the second paper they did, which I thought was really interesting, was they took PLA, the... Um, what is it, poly something acid, that is the most uh, common, I think, 3D printing material, at least that's what I use. And, you know, when you print something, it's generally, uh, you know, like half air. There's a lot of space in it. It's not just full PLA. So they would put PLA material in with supersaturated solution, let the thing crystallize, and then you have the crystals within the PLA solution. And that could be really neat in terms of, um, I mean, that's definitely something that I want to try to replicate. For this one, I'm just going to try to do distilled, see whether it works with distilled water and whether it's more um, piezo and or ferroelectric. But I'll, if I can, I'll dig out the article. No promises. So here we have our super saturated solution. Pour it in here. That essentially is it. The only thing I'm going to do, I'm going to move this over to the um, counter, the uh, windowsill here. And um, one of the nice things is that it's becoming chilly now. And so um, because of the colder the thing gets, the um, less of it will go into solution. And, and so they're saying if you don't have success, you know, try putting it in the refrigerator. So this should hopefully um, help it along a little bit since it's um, becoming chilly heading towards winter. So I hope I have success with this. We'll check back in on it and uh, probably take about two, three days for the crystals to fully form. But you can start to see them forming after a day or so. So here we are one day later. I'm not sure if it's showing up that well on the camera but up around um, top and to the left there we can see the crystals starting to form so it'll probably take another couple days before this is fully formed okay so this has been sitting here for I don't know like three or four days now I was pretty much done after a day or two but I wanted everything to, to fully set so I, I <laughs> I've kind of put like a magician's handkerchief on this just to make it dramatic for the Grand Dumas. So, and there we have it. I don't know if it shows up that well on the camera. There are your Rochelle salt crystals. So here we can sort of do a side-by-side -side comparison. This was the stuff that I grew with um, tap water, which you can't get away with. And these are the crystals that I grew with distilled water. They look similar, but these are obviously a bit more translucent. The other issue is there's an occasional good crystal. There's one. That's what you want. And then, I don't know how well it will show up on the camera, but what you end up seeing when you look at this is that there are other crystals like that but they're just like layered one on top of each, uh, of another. So there's, you know, like 70 crystals like this, just all mushed together. 
and what you would like would be you know one just a few large crystals so now I get that what they say you're supposed to do is um, take a crystal like this use it as a seed crystal maybe a couple others that are very good and then repeat the process and then you have larger um, you know much more consistent crystals so that's um, that's something that I'll look to do going forward but let's just see what we got here and see if we can see any piezoelectricity and any ferroelectricity they are kind of cool they look nice okay so let's see what we got so I got I think that one's a pretty much a single crystal it was another good one I found that I kind of dug out of that mess and I put it between just two plates of copper and then you know I don't know I mean maybe you don't even need them all single crystals. I mean, one of the things I'd like to do is just take all of this stuff, put it in a blender till you have a powder, and then use the powder. And that might be the way to go because otherwise, unless the crystal's like perfect, um, you don't have good surface contact there. I don't know if that's important or not. So I just put a meter on it and it's just sitting there, you know, like 2.5, well, it's going down now, 2.3 millivolts. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit it with um, with this thing. Let's see what happens. Hey, there it is. There it is. Now I admit it's a little bit underwhelming. <laughs> I mean. I will say that that's piezoelectricity. You know, I've, I've, I've done it. I was kind of like hoping for, for like five volts or something, and it's five millivolts. So that's not so good. Um, I could put a cap across it just to smooth things out, and because maybe it's going up to to like twenty. It probably is, <laughs> but you just can't see it. I mean, literally, it's probably going a little bit higher than that, but it's just so little current, it just drains out immediately. But I won't lie to you, that's a bit disappointing. And I also won't lie to you, I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, here's here's like a commercial piezoelectric thing. I just, there was like 10 of these from, I don't know, like Harbor Freight for like a penny or something like that. But let's see what it does. So what you see here is the same idea. You've got, a, I guess, there's maybe like brass or copper there. And then they just put the dielectric material, the, the, the piezoelectric, and it's like almost sprayed on there instead of this big crystal. Um, and then they um, just soldered an electrode just right to the dielectric. So there's one plate there. And, Let's see what this does. Well, that's a little bit better. That's like a volt. I have no idea why mine sucks. Hmm. So this thing's getting half a volt. And this thing stinks. I mean, it won't stay at half a volt. I mean, that's like... But you kind of almost see it there. It went up to half a volt. Uh, for a moment and this thing stinks so it might be see how that is just sprayed on there and then um, and then soldered on and here you have this big chunk of crystal so that might not be what you want here I think this is good material I don't know what material that is it could be Rochelle salt it could be like barium titanate or, or one of the others so let's do one last thing. Let's blast it with 5,000 volts and see if we can see any um, ferroelectricity. So here we got that at 5,000 volts. It'll dip down to like 3,001 and get it sparking. Right. So what I'm trying to do is see if there's going to be that hysteresis curve and you get a um, a difference in voltage after it's been exposed to a high voltage. I have difficulty 
what I want. Now what the heck, I mean I have no idea what the material is, but this one's kind of cool because the spark kind of wants to spread out over all of the dielectric. I seem to be blasting some of the dielectric off. <laughs> well this is actually kind of cool. So now I've got the meter hooked up again. We zap this thing. It's going across the uh, voltmeter and a little cap, and it's sitting at about a third of a volt, just sitting there. So that's the hysteresis curve that Velasic was talking about and that he, that he showed. Now I'm going to discharge it. comes right back. I'm going to discharge it again. Let's put in a big cap. This is, I think, 1 UF. Let's put in 1,000 UF. I'm just curious what the current flow is. So here's a 1,000 UF cap across there. And it's, it's having trouble making it back to, I think it was 0.35 or, or right around there, or 0.34. But let's short it. And it springs back pretty quick. I think if you gave it time, it would it would eventually get close to, to back to, to 0 0.35. So that's kind of cool. I mean, you just zap the thing once, and then you're sitting at a cool third of a volt. That, I mean, I would say that's a crystal battery. There's no dissimilar material. There's no water. Um, it's just... You hit it with some voltage, and it's like you see with cap rebound, except for this isn't tech. Well, it is a capacitor. So it's a lot like cap rebound. It's just a question of how long does it persist with this, with this um, material in the hysteresis curve of the Rochelle salt. But it seems to seems to want to keep coming back, keep heading back towards right towards a third of a volt, or at least three tenths. I will say it didn't work with this one, and I don't think this is Rochelle salt. So I don't think this material, while it, this material is piezoelectric, whatever it is, is not apparently ferroelectric. So I guess you know, I mean, you can kind of. You can kind of dream here, but this actually isn't that far off of a dream. Is um, you know, if I pick up a a um, Van de Graaff generator, I have a little battery-powered Wimshurst, and that I mean that might get me to ten, twenty thousand volts, which would be to repeat this. But you probably want a Van de Graaff generator, and. We were hitting this, I mean, it was at 5,000. The, the sparks were maybe 3,000, 4,000 volts, and we're sitting at 0.3 volts. Now, it's not linear, or is it? Because if it's linear, and you go up to 300,000 volts, then you'd be sitting at 30 volts. If you went up to 3 million, you'd be sitting at 300 volts. Um, I'm not, again, I don't, I don't know if it's linear. But I'm saying there's there's orders of magnitude that you can go up on the on the voltage, and with something like a Vandegraaff, you could get to 300,000 or 3 million or something like that without a great deal of difficulty. So, you know, it was good news, bad news situation. Bad news, I I don't yet have the um, piezoelectric part at all figured out, um, but you can see it. That's all I can say is you can see it. Um, it's about as much as I was seeing with wood. But the um, ferroelectricity is a little bit better. See, we're climbing right back up there. Let's, oh, now it's going down a bit. Let's hit it again. And it's coming right back. So again, I don't know if that lasts for an hour or for a day or for indefinitely like an electorate. 
where it lasts indefinitely. Oh, that's the very last thing, and then I'll then I'll shut up because this has been a long video. Is the other thing to do is when you let the crystal sit, and this is how they make an electrode, but it's not it's not with this material. It's it's basically like beeswax, um, but the same idea that you use with an electrode is put the 5,000 volts into the um, the Rochelle salt while it's in super saturated solution and then ideally when the crystals come out they think that that's the normal environment and then um, you turn the that off and then you might have crystals that sit at uh, uh, you know with a very very strong um, uh, voltage that just sit there indefinitely because they were formed at that 5,000 uh, volt potential. Okay, I'll shut up now, but thanks for uh, watching. And if if you are having fun, and uh, you know, maybe again, I, I have no idea what I'm doing, but if you're learning a bit, then uh, please feel free to like, subscribe, and comment. And uh, until next time, stay healthy, everyone. Bye bye.